Let's all stand. Praise God. Let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Wonderful Jesus. Thank you, God, for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Oh, and thank you for your peace, for your anointing, sweet Jesus. Thank you for this opportunity to open up your word, to hear from you today. Jesus, I pray that you would open up our hearts, oh God, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would speak to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So if you haven't seen on Facebook or have heard, I'm back in school. And um, so to be honest, this lesson and the next few lessons are inspired by some things that I have been studying this week. Um, So just fair warning. Um, I'm going to have all sorts of material by the time this is done. So I'm going to start this morning in the book of Jonah. We're just going to do some lessons from Jonah for the next few weeks. So I'm just simply calling today Lessons from Jonah, part one. So Jonah chapter one, verses one through three. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah, y'all know the story, rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We know the story. So I'm not bringing any kind of passage to you that you've never read in your entire life. And you're probably thinking, why in the world is Sister Jan going over the book of Jonah when it's been preached a hundred thousand times? But I firmly believe that there are lessons that we may not have heard before that we can learn from the book of Jonah. Jonah lived during the reign of King Jeroboam II, and that's somewhere between 787 and 746 BC, and was a prophet of the Lord. The book just simply opens up with the Lord speaking to his prophet. What a way to begin a book. The Lord says, Jonah, I have two things for you to do. The first thing I have for you to do is to go. That's an interesting command when when you read scripture, a lot of times the Lord will say, let the nations come to me to worship. Let let, let them come to Zion to see God lifted up. Let, Let the people that are outside of Israel come to Israel in order to learn about the one true God. But in the book of Jonah, the command is for Jonah to go to the nations. God is sending Jonah outside of Israel to the Assyrians that are living in this terribly corrupt city of Nineveh. Jonah is supposed to go to them. You all know by now that one of my favorite questions is to ask why. Why in the world would God send Jonah to Nineveh when most of the time God says for them to come to him? I really think that it's because most likely the Ninevites would never come to Israel to worship God. So God sent Jonah to them. It's an awful lot like the command that's given to us. If you read Matthew 28, 19, Jesus tells his disciples and really tells us, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. It's like that old Christmas song, go tell it on the mountain, right? You and I are supposed to go and tell. Jesus commands his disciples, including you and me, to go. You and I have a mandate to tell those that are around us about our great God. 
We are to go to them because honestly, saints, it's most likely they just might not come to us here. We need to go to them. I have said um, often that I have started doing what I can down here because, frankly, this is my heart. My heart is here. I feel like my calling is here. So I want to reach people here. So when I'm getting my car serviced, I come to the, the Honda dealer here. You never know who you're going to reach here. God sends us. God's second command to Jonah is to cry against Nineveh because, quote, their wickedness is come up before me. How bad was Nineveh anyway? Um, if you read the prophet Nahum, start in chapter 3, and I'm going to read just the first four verses, and I, I don't know that I even should read that, because it's, it's a pretty, pretty scathing review of the city of Nineveh. Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 says, Woe to the bloody city! It is full of lies and robbery! The prey departeth not, the noise of a whip, the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear and there's a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble, they're a bloody, murderous city. And verse 4, because of the multitude of whoredom, so it's not just that they're uh, killing people, but they're doing things that are just despicable, of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witch. Nineveh was not a good place to be. It wasn't that God just said, go preach somewhere. It's almost as if God picked the most wicked place that he could. To send Jonah to. Um, one of the authors in my textbook, Johann Verkel, describes Nineveh this way. It says that God sends Jonah to Nineveh of all places. Nineveh, a very center of totalitarianism, brutality, and warlike attitudes. To Nineveh, notorious for the shameful hounding, vicious torture, and imperialist brazenness it reserved for those who chose to op oppose its policies. God wants his servant to warn Nineveh of impending judgment and to call her to repentance. But the most amazing thing to me about all of this is that God sends Jonah to this wicked city. Are you ready? Because he wants to save them. That speaks volumes of God's love toward us. If God is willing to send his prophet to a city that is that wicked because he wants to save them, oh, the love that God has for us. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while you and I were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That tells me there is no sin so great that God cannot forgive it. There is no sinner so lost that God cannot save them. There is no place so wicked that God does not want to reach it. In fact, I've become convinced that even if Adolf Hitler himself had repented, God would have saved him. Because it's God's desire that nobody perish but that all would have eternal life. So God tells Jonah to go and preach repentance to that wicked city of Nineveh. And what does Jonah do? He's a godly man. He runs away. Now I know, I am absolutely, positively, completely convinced that you wonderful, godly, obedient people have never, ever, ever in your entire life ever done anything like that. You have Always obey God every single time he's spoken to you. <laughs> yeah, you're telling on yourself. Uh, you know, now, 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 I'll be, I'll be honest here. I've 
not always been obedient. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we've not always been obedient to the Lord. And there are still times every once in a while, it doesn't happen as often as it used to. Thank you, Jesus. I've learned a few little things. But when the Lord wants to deal with me about something, there are just times, Sister Debbie. Doesn't happen often. But there are times, la, 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 la. I'm not listening. I don't want to talk about this right now. You ever had anybody do that to you? I don't want to talk about this right now. I don't want to deal with this right now. (laughs) I remember a missions conference at Calvary Tabernacle. I was 14, 15, maybe somewhere around there. And um, in the middle of that conference, I I don't really remember like at what point in time, I just remember the Lord speaking to me about going to Africa. And I remember, and I promise you, I honestly said this to God, and I'm not proud of it, but it's the truth. I looked at God and I said, God, there had better be an Africa, Indiana, or an Africa, Ohio, because I am not going to step foot on the continent of Africa. I don't even remember why. I did not want to go, but man, I was I was not going to go. <laughs> I can't believe I had the gall to say that to God, but um, I did. <laughs> I was bound and determined. But you know what the funny thing is? The very first missions trip that I ever took was to South Africa <laughs> um, with seasoned missionaries, Bug and Nona Freeman of all people, as the guide. It was a cool trip. And I actually got to meet somebody Friday from South Africa. I can't wait to go back to Richmond and talk to her again. It's actually kind of exciting. But um, I found out as I was preparing for that trip, that apparently, and I don't, re- I honestly don't remember this, but my mom, my dad, and my sister all um, attest to this story that when I was really little, I proclaimed, and I could see me doing it too, I'm going to grow up and be a missionary to Africa. <laughs> be careful what you say. <laughs> And we'll talk about this a little bit more, I'm sure, through the story. But for now, can I just tell you, it's best really to never tell the Lord no. (laughs) He will call you on it, I promise. Jonah decides that the only thing that he can do is to flee from the presence of the Lord. Have you ever read that and thought, silly Jonah? Do you not realize that you can't ever get away from the presence of the Lord? The psalmist tells us that even if we were to make our bed in hell, in other words, the grave is really what it's referring to, we cannot escape the presence of the Lord. But silly Jonah, it's almost laughable that he would think that he could actually outrun God. But how many times have you or I, or somebody that we know really thinks they can outrun the call of God. You can't. But I know people that try. And you probably do too. Verses 4 and 5, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. So that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, little G. And cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. Now, grant you, I think that when Jonah first got on the ship, it was probably smooth sailing. It was all good. Jonah said it's so smooth, it's so calm, it's so cool and collected. I'm just going to take me a nap. He thought he could rest because he had finally, or so he thought, escaped the presence of the Lord. It was working out okay. He had the money to pay for the fare. Those wicked Ninevites didn't deserve even to be warned about God's impending judgment. They certainly didn't deserve to receive God's mercy. It was all good for Jonah for a little bit. God allowed Jonah 
to run for a little bit. But eventually, God sent a storm to try to wake Jonah up. Jonah was a prophet. He was a servant of God. God had placed a call on Jonah. God had given a commandment to Jonah to go and preach. Jonah had been sent by God. God had a plan and a purpose for Jonah and for Nineveh. God doesn't give up easy. Though Jonah ran, God pursued him. Though Jonah rebelled, God still desired to use him. 1 Corinthians 6.11 is where my heart went when I was thinking about this. And such were some of you. But we're washed. We're sanctified. We are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Though you and I have run from Him, He pursues us. Oh, thank God. Though we may have rebelled against Him, He still desires to use us. Jeremiah 3.22 says, Return, you backsliding children. And I, God says, will heal your backslidings. Although you and I may not always do right, God desires to heal us and to restore us even when we rebel against him. Oh, thank God. Isn't it interesting to note that God sends a mass of storms and the winds and the very sea obey him and yet God's prophet sleeps through the storm that was meant for him. Isn't it interesting that the heathen crew pray to their false gods while the prophet of the one true God ignores the very situation as if he doesn't even care what is happening? This is a horrible storm. The crew are all crying out to their false gods for help. They're throwing supplies overboard. The storm is coming down so hard that they fear losing the boat and the entire crew. In fact, in verse 6, Jonah um, says, So the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon your God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Isn't it interesting that all these false gods are being prayed to, but the one who knows the true God isn't praying at all? There's so much, Pastor, about this story that makes me go, wow, can't I just shake Jonah? Dude, you've got a huge opportunity to share the truth of the word of God with these people and you're there sleeping. I find my heart going, God, don't let me sleep. Every time that you send an opportunity my way, Lord, let me take advantage of those opportunities. I don't want to be a Jonah. Jonah doesn't even whisper a prayer at this point. In fact, the crew who, who are obviously heathen, they don't believe in the one true God. Even they recognize that the storm is sent from God. They recognize the spirituality of the storm that is going on around them. In fact, they get to the point where they cast lots. Or you and I would kind of say they choose straws. And they find out that Jonah gets the short end of the stick. It's Jonah's fault. They had enough spirituality about themselves. Even though they didn't believe in God, they knew that the storm was of a spiritual nature. And the one that could give them the answer refused to give them the answer. Goodness, that's convicting. I look around at our nation today and we are in a spiritual storm. There is all sorts of spiritual stuff going on in the heavenlies. Around our nation, around our government, around our city. Will we decide to not do what Jonah did? Will we decide to tell people what is really going on? 
you and I have a decision to make. <laughs> the heathens were more spiritually in tune than Jonah. That's crazy. Let it not be said of you or me that those around us that are not following God are more spiritually in tune than we are. I want my spiritual antennae to be up constantly seeking after what's going on in the spirit realm. The crew began to ask Jonah what was up with all the storm. What is, what's going on? And one gets the sense that Jonah's like, yeah, well, it's my fault. I serve the true God. You know, he's coming after me. <laughs> what is up with that? There's this crazy storm going on and Jonah's like, yeah, well, sorry about you. It's my fault. <laughs> what? I can almost see this crazy storm going on and Jonah going, yeah, okay. Do whatever you got to do to me. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> the crew is completely out of options. They, they begin to ask Jonah then, if it's your fault, then what do we do? And Jonah says, well, you know, just throw me overboard and it'll be okay. rather die than to obey God. Oh my word. His callousness just amazes me. Because his whole thought is just kill me and get it over with. It's so easy to open up the pages of the book of Jonah because we know the story so well. It is really easy to gloss over just how callous Jonah had become. I really think, and, and I was reading over it all again this morning, I, I, I'm wondering what kind of bitterness Jonah must have had in his heart to be so callous that he didn't care what happened to the ship he didn't care what happened to the crew. He didn't care what happened to Nineveh. So I began to ask some questions. What do you do with somebody who's just so set on rebelling against God? What do you do with someone you know has a call of God on their life and yet refuses to obey God? Those are good questions to ask. What do you do with that? The heathen crew were, were so honorable. They tried their best to get the ship back to land so they could get Jonah safely to shore. But the storm was just too great. They did the only thing that they knew to do. They prayed. <laughs> this time they prayed to the one true God. In fact, verses 14 through 16 says, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, O God, we've heard about you, now we're praying. We beseech thee, don't let us perish because of this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, Lord, they recognize it's God, has done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and poof, cast him forth into the sea. Threw him overboard. I don't even think they took the time to get the plank and make him walk. <laughs> I think they just grabbed him up and threw him overboard, man. And as soon as they threw him overboard, verse 15 says, And the sea ceased from her raging. Verse 16 is telltale. Then the men, the mariners, the, the crew, feared the Lord exceedingly. Ah! <laughs> And the, the Bible says they offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and they made vows. Man, they just came through this crazy situation. They realized that it's God. They realized that they had the man of God that was in rebellion. So they threw him overboard and boom, God took, takes care of it. <gasps> we need to pray to that God. <laughs> we need to serve that God. Now, before you misconstrue anything that I've just said, I do not suggest that you take anybody and throw them overboard if they're running from God. <laughs> I do not suggest that. That is not the right thing to do. <laughs> now, pastor. <laughs> oh, Lord. I should have prayed longer this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Their example, however, of prayer 
and release is an example to us. They realized that there was nothing more that they could do on a personal level to help Jonah. They could not make him change. So they put Jonah into the hands of the one that could. So what do you and I do with those who are running from the Lord? We do exactly what the crew did. We love them. We pray for them. And then we've got to release them into the hands of God. There's only so much that you and I can do on a physical, personal level. When there are spiritual things that need to be done, saints, that's God's work, not ours. You and I must turn those people into the hands of the one who can change them. Keep praying. Keep loving them. But keep trusting that God is at work in their lives. Whether you ever see it or not. Because when the crew threw Jonah overboard. They never saw him again. But they put him into the hands of the one that could take care of him. The crew believed that Jonah was going to die. When they saw that the storm ceased immediately, the crew (laughs) had church. (laughs) It freaked them out a little bit. They began praying, offering sacrifices, making vows. Despite Jonah's rebellion, and this just like leapt off the pages of scripture for me. Though Jonah was in rebellion, still God got glory. I remember one lady, and, and I won't mention your na- mention her name. She's not here, but um, one particular lady I remember years ago we were talking, and she had spent some time backslidden and away from the Lord. And she would tell me stories about how she learned to drive drunk. She learned how to handle herself in a quote unquote good manner when she was drunk and she loved alcohol when she was backslidden from the Lord but she would tell me that there would be times that she was sitting at the bar and she would have so much alcohol in her that she couldn't think straight and yet the things that started coming out of her mouth was Acts 238 is the right way to salvation You must repent. You must be baptized in Jesus' name. You must be filled with the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in tongues. She began to preach to those around her. Despite her backslidden state, she began to tell them about salvation. God even used her to reveal the truth to others, even when she was backslidden. That always takes me to Romans 11, 29. For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. If God has called you, he has marked you. If God has anointed you, it doesn't matter if you are still living for the Lord or if you're rebelling against him. If God has called you, you are a marked person and it doesn't matter how far you run away from it, that marking will remain and others will still be affected because the call of God is still on your life. God will use us despite us. Thank God. Verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah may have been done with God, but God was not done with Jonah. Thank God. Jonah thought he was going to drown, but God had other plans. Jonah could not escape God's call. That's because the call of God is bigger than just Jonah. God desired to save Nineveh, and God was going to make sure that Nineveh heard the truth. God didn't spare Jonah for Jonah's sake, y'all. God spared Jonah for Nineveh's sake. God continued to pursue Jonah so Jonah could be prepared to fulfill God's plan in reaching Nineveh. You and I will never be able to escape the call of God. We can't. No matter how far we run or how long it's been since we've served him fully, you and I will never escape his hand on our lives. And I'm thankful I've heard it said, I don't know that I necessarily like the 
the illustration, uh, but in some ways it's true. The hound of heaven pursues us constantly. The second thing I see in this first chapter of Jonah is that the call of God on our lives is so much bigger than us. God calls us, yes, because he loves us and and he wants to save us and, and he wants to use us for his glory. But that isn't the only reason why God calls us. He doesn't just call us to make us feel God's love or his anointing or his power. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you I love it. When I'm in prayer, or I'm in service, or I'm, I'm talking about the Lord. I love feeling the presence of the Lord wrap his arms around me. I love feeling the anointing of the Holy Ghost when I'm singing or teaching or preaching. I enjoy feeling the power of God. I absolutely just revel in the presence of the Lord. I love that feeling. And there are huge benefits to being in the presence of God and having a calling on our lives. But the calling on my life and the calling on your life, really, saints, is not just about you. If you believe that you have a work to do, that in and of yourself you're fully able to complete it, I hate to tell you, that ain't the call of God. That's just your gifts and abilities. The call of God will stretch you beyond your natural abilities because that call is always bigger than you. When God calls you to do something, the best thing that you and I can say is, I can't do it, but you can do it through me. The third lesson that I see in that first chapter of Jonah is that God will not stop working on you and me until we are prepared to be that honorable vessel for his kingdom. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, what God starts, he will complete. Ah, thank you, Jesus. He starts it and he intends to complete it because he wants to use you and me to complete his will. It is often said that God does not need our ability. He just needs our availability. And I hate to tell you, he doesn't need our sensibility. He needs our surrender. When I think about what God is doing, will you stand with me? When I think about what God is doing in my life and in your life and in this church, sometimes it can get really overwhelming because there's so much to be done. There are so many souls to be reached. There is a lost and dying world just outside those doors that need us to go. And you and I can't do it on our own. So when we pray, before we go into worship service, will you pray with me this kind of prayer, Lord, I'm available to you to do whatever it is that you want me to do. Let's pray. Oh, sweet Jesus, I feel your call and your anointing and your presence. Oh, sweet Jesus, your word is truth. Oh, my King, help us, Jesus. Would you take my availability and use it for your kingdom? Would you take our availabilities, Jesus, today and make us the vessels of honor for your kingdom? Will you take us and use us today and prepare us today, oh God, to be the vessels of honor for your kingdom and for your glory? We can't do this on our own. We can't make it on our own. So God, all we can do is give ourselves to you today. You're not asking for our sensibility.
Jesus. You're asking for our surrender. You're not asking for our abilities. You're asking for our availabilities. Oh, Jesus, we are available to you. We are available to you. for your kingdom. Use us for your glory. Oh, in Jesus' name, make us what you'd have us to be. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.